distinguished filmmaker and theater director. I just learned he's got two more scripts to work on and make them into films. Um, so without further ado, I invite him to come and speak on the making of his film Garam Hawa and anything else he wishes to speak on. How many of you have seen Garam Hawa? Almost all. Mm. On a laptop, not on the screen. Oh. This is a pirated copy that you people have seen. <laughs> <laughs> Because we have not brought out the DVD of this film, although it is uh, 38 years old. Now we are planning to re release the film. We have restored the entire film. It is, you know, these days you have the technology where digitally you can correct and, and remove all the dust and scratches and things like that, frame by frame. So we have done nearly 2,50,000 frames. Digitally, we have corrected it. And uh, we sent the sound, which was a mono sound. Um, at the time, there wasn't any stereo also. And now we sent it to America, uh, in Los Angeles, there is a lab called Deluxe Lab. And they have converted that into Dolby Digital and surround sound, five, five plus one you know, surround. So uh, the whole quality is very different. It has enhanced, uh, so, I mean, the amount of money one spent to make the film was a very small amount, but um, the restoration is mind-blowing. <laughs> it it's like, a, like making a few more films, you know, that much money. Uh, goes into this kind of a work. Um, but we felt, some of our friends also felt that the today's generation and um, the younger ones and the, even the ones generation born after the independence of India and after the partition of India need to see a film on an because this recent history of ours should not be forgotten. It has to be reminded to the people and brought back to the people. So that's the reason why we have gone through this whole elaborate process and spending a lot of money uh, to restore it. We are planning to release the film in theaters, you know, any, any time soon. We've already shown it once in uh, Goa, the International Film Festival, recent, in the last no November. Uh, we showed it there. The response was very good. Uh, and so we feel uh, two generations are there who can see the film. You see, I mean, uh, it is a, um, a strange thing which happened. Uh, by accident, this film was made. I gave a script to the Film Finance Corporation, which was headed by B.K. Karanjia, and uh, he read my s other script, and then he said, no, this is too negative. Um, we want you to give a, 
a different story. So we were talking about the, this kind of a thing with the late um, Isma Chuktai, the Urdu writer. And uh, we gave this script and it was accepted within a week's time. It was sanctioned that one could make the film, you know. So it, like this, and accidentally we landed up with this film. Uh, this was not my intention to make this as a, my first film, uh, but my first film was later on made um, in Calcutta uh, when the Naxal movement had died down to an extent and uh, the students in that period were very confused. So, so I made the film in Calcutta, an actual uh, in the university area and you know, on the streets of Calcutta. And I also introduced uh, Anil Kapoor, a famous Hindi actor today. Um, I, he was introduced in this film. Uh, also Sharon Prabhaka was introduced and then we had Pankaj Kapoor also introduced in this film. They were all <laughs> very young at the time. Yeah, it was again in the same period as um, the 80s. In fact, I made another film also, um, Bara, in the same time. Kannada. Yeah, and it is both in Kannada and Hindi. In Hindi, it is called Sukha. So that was shot in Bidar district. Uh, it was US. You are Anant Murthy's uh, script. Not a script, only the story material. The script was done by Shama Zaidi and uh, Javed Siddiqui, and we did that film. Um, so, coming back to Garam Hoa as such, you know, in the, in the hundred years of our cinema, there are a lot of films which are been made and uh, unfortunately the minority communities whether it is a Christian or a Muslim or a or a Marwadi or a, you know people like that almost always caricatured it's never shown as a real part of our mainstream. They are part of the mainstream of this country. Unfortunately, it has happened either. You will have a, you will make them a smuggler. Uh, a Muslim can be a smuggler, underworld, and then maybe Nawab degenerate, like in Pakistan and things like that. Or in the student world, also when you show Mere Me Boob, uh, that way, you know, with a lot of flourish for uh, Urdu poetry. It is not necessary. Every Muslim knows Urdu poetry. You know, it's false. It is not so. But Urdu poetry is also known to many Hindus also. In fact, some of the great writers in uh, Hindu writers who wrote in um, Urdu language because that was the language at that time um, that is pre-independence and then um, even Munshi Premchand wrote in Urdu you know Rajendra Singh Bedi wrote in Urdu although he was a Punjabi so it is somewhere we uh, unfortunately, equate language with religion, which is not so. Language is a totally different entity by itself. You know, you belong to a particular region, so that's why you speak a particular language and the particular culture you develop. Now, a Malayali, you know, nearly 40% of the Malayalis are Muslims but they don't know a single word of Urdu. Not necessary at all. 
you know, to know Urdu. They read their Quran also uh, in Malayalam. You see? So this, uh, somehow we have started associating language with uh, religion, which is totally wrong. Please come this side. I can't go on looking there. <laughs> so here in Garam Hawa, uh, we showed the after effects of uh, partition. It is not about partition itself. And I, in fact, I don't show partition. Like, say, in Tamas by Govind Nailani, actual things were shown, scenes from the partition. They recreated migrating people and things like that. Or if you take a film like uh, Train to Pakistan, again you have uh, the migration shown there. Uh, that kind of a thing I have not done in uh, Garam Hawa because uh, you know, people were migrating to Pakistan till about 1956. 47 was the partition, and till 1956, people were migrating, especially in the North Indian from UP. And when they went to Pakistan, hoping that there is a dream world for them, they were totally disappointed. They were not accepted. The UP uh, Muslims were not accepted by the Punjabi Muslims. So they couldn't settle down in the Punjab, the, the Pakistan Punjab. You know. So they had to again from there migrate to places like Sindh. You know, like in Karachi, they went and established themselves. And some of them even migrated further. They went away to Canada, they went away to the Emirates and things like that. But they couldn't settle down in the Punjab of Pakistan, which is the main portion of Pakistan. So this, uh, I mean, I myself has not been a victim of partition. I have not experienced the partition myself. But I have heard a lot of stories from various people whom I was associated with. And um, so, because everyone says, you know, how is it that you, coming from Mysore, belonging to a Brahmin family, doing a film on the Muslims of UP, and trying to, you know, uh, recreate an era which you had not seen, I said, it's not necessary. It's only your sensitivity which is more important as a filmmaker. Your perception is more important as a filmmaker. You can do anything, any film you can make. If you, if you are any subject you can tackle, if you have that perception in you, you know, that's a sensitivity in you. So it is not necessary that you belong to a particular place and only then you can make a film. I mean, that is a very, uh, simple kind of uh, analysis and uh, it doesn't happen so. Uh, the, I mean, when, when we think, think of uh, uh, Shakespeare being done in various languages and uh, not, you don't have to be an Englishman or belong to Great Britain to do Shakespeare. Russians have done Shakespeare. Italians have done Shakespeare, Americans have done Shakespeare, and even Indians have done a lot of Shakespeare. In fact, many of our, in Canada itself, many of our writers who, who wrote uh, and translated uh, Mac, all these uh, plays, Shakespearean plays at a particular time, and even when they wrote their own novels, it was very much Shakespearean, you know, when they wrote their own uh, plays, 
It was very, very Shakespearean. So this is a, that was a great influence on the writers. So it's not necessary that um, you cannot be sensitive. In fact, next week there is a production of uh, uh, Macbeth in Canada at the Ranga Shankara. Uh, it is done by uh, Kambar, uh, and it's a new translation which he has done. Mm, and uh, so it is possible for a Kannadiga to react to something so alien, you know, and recreate it. So in that way. So to me also, um, my experience in life, yes, I'd met a lot of people who had uh, migrated from Pakistan to India. And uh, I'd also met some people who migrated from India to Pakistan. And so um, that experience itself was enough. Uh, and I had a fair knowledge of the, the Muslim families, how they lived um, in UP. And the whole film was shot in Agra, if, if you have, remember. Because um, I, I have a close association with the Muslims because my wife is a Muslim, although non, not a believer, but uh, still. I mean, <laughs> we are all non-believers. <laughs> so that is a, another added help in um, analyzing a situation like this. There is no prejudice of any kind. So, so this in Garam Hawa, we showed the Muslim family which was disintegrating by and large, and family members who couldn't go on in this country, they deprived of uh, facilities, they deprived of uh, jobs, and uh, deprived of a business, and things like that. They started migrating, thinking that Pakistan would, uh, being an Islamic country, would help them. But it is not true. Um, so in, in Garam Hawa, we showed that Salim Mirza, who is the protagonist of the whole play, I mean, whole film, uh, is a factory owner, a, a, a shoe factory owner. And how his business goes about, and how his family disintegrates. But there are lots of people who stayed back in India. Muslims didn't migrate after the partition. And that's exactly what happened to Salim Mirza. He was not keen on going to Pakistan. And his mother was not at all keen. She said, I want to be buried next to my husband in here. Why should I go to a foreign country and die? You know? So that sentiment was very important. So there were a lot of people who stayed back. In India, I think India is the second largest Muslim populated country in the world after Indonesia. The Arab countries don't have so many Muslims. The Pakistan doesn't have so many Muslims. And Bangladesh doesn't have that many Muslims. It is in India, the second largest Muslim population you will find. And a Muslim population here belonging to different languages, you know, different regions, culturally very different, ethnically they are different, but they follow one religion, you know. The tenets of Islam is what they follow, that's all. Culturally, they can be very different. Their cuisine is very different, you know. So this, if, if one could understand, as a filmmaker, you have to know exactly when you're dealing with a certain family, you must go deeply into the functioning of that family. 
with their business, their home affairs, their love affairs, their, you know, all such uh, very intimate uh, things that happen in a family. Now, you know, for example, the girl, uh, Amina, I mean, sometimes I forget the names of my own characters. <laughs> because it's very difficult to remember. Uh, Amna, you know, she belonged to this particular family, which is a fairly orthodox and um, conservative, you know. And then there is no scope for a girl like that, a grown-up girl like that, to mix with people outside. So she is within the family. So invariably it so happens in many, many Muslim families uh, of this kind, uh, the love affairs are between cousins. And that's exactly what happens uh, in Garam Hawa with Amana. And one disappointment takes place uh, with one of the cousins. And then in the, with the second cousin, she was more intimate. She premarital sex was also there. And that also failed. He went away to Pakistan, which was a role played by Jalal Aga. And then he doesn't return. He, 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 he marries someone else. So that whole shock, you know, especially after having had sex with a person, to her it was too much to take. And so she commits suicide. I mean, that, that was the only logical end that she could see. You know. So this, I mean, I know suicide is no answer to anything. It's a very negative attitude, but inevitable sometimes. And so in Garam Hawa, we have had to, we had to show uh, the sequence of her death. In, and um, it, was, um, a, it was very cruel on my part as a director when I asked Balra Sahani to do this part of um, the suicide, after, this, after the suicide scene, when he comes and sees his daughter dead with all the trousseau lying around. Actually, in real life, it so happened uh, that Balra Sahani was married twice. The first wife's daughter, Shabnam, uh, was in love with a Muslim character, Muslim, I mean, film, filmmaker, actually, in Bombay. And um, Balra Sahani had no problem about it because he was, he was uh, accepted, accepting this uh, relationship and he was, and being a communist on top, so it, was, it didn't matter to him at all, to what, what religion and things like that. But so happens that uh, his uh, mother was very old. She persisted on Balra Sahani not to marry her, his daughter to a Muslim. And that some weak moment in his life, he accepted his mother's suggestion, and then she was married to a Punjabi girl, gentleman from uh, uh, Calcutta. So Shabnam was married, and she was very unhappy. The mother-in-law was all through um, nagging her and uh, always talking about her having had an affair with a Muslim, you know, and, and this went on for a long time, and she lost her mental equi equilibrium and then she left and came back to um, Bombay 
and started staying with Balrasani. And then she tried to uh, join a school to teach children. And it was going on for some time. But, but still, she was totally disturbed. And uh, she ultimately committed suicide. So she had, she went to the bath, had a, a bath, and the flowing hair was there. And then she slept on the bed, and she died. So anyway, I was one of the persons at that time in their house, and we had to get the postmortem done because the family doctor refused to give a certificate. So the postmortem was done overnight. And Balrasani was somewhere in Madhya Pradesh, um, you know, in an election campaign. And we didn't know how to get him. So ultimately, we contacted the chief minister of Madhya Pradesh. And then he f found him in some rural area and then brought him to Bhopal. And from there, he was uh, uh, transported to Bombay by private uh, <coughs> chief minister's aircraft. And I went to receive him. Uh, it was around 10 o'clock in the morning. I, I brought him in my car uh, to the, his house. And there was a whole lot of uh, you know, friends and relations who had gathered. And uh, we had kept, after the post-mortem, we had kept the body of Shabnam on her bed. He didn't talk to anybody, didn't see anybody. He just walked up the steps and opened the door and stood there. And no tears in his eyes. Now, if you remember, that sequence in Garam Hawa, it has been shot exactly like that. You know? I mean, this is <laughs> from, from a filmmaker. I, have to, had, I said once, sometimes you have to be very cruel. And I was cruel to Balrasi. But Balrasi was a very sensitive man. And we had worked for a long number of years, both on stage, you know. Uh, Nipta and in the Jew art theater and things like that. So we knew each other very well. And he immediately knew what I was trying to get at. So I said, Balraji, Gita is lying on the bed. I didn't say Amana also. I said, Gita is lying on the bed. She was the actress. And you come there and open the door and, and no tears in your eyes, you see. He said, just, he said, he nodded like that. And then, so he did that scene in that manner. So how a personal thing which happened in his life, I tried to do it in, in cinema. And it, it works out very well, because it's a very genuine kind of a, a sequence in the whole film. Um, I mean, we filmmakers are very selfish, I suppose. To get what we want, we, you know, do such things to our actors, even to other. Even when, you know, in Bara, for example, the very first sequence, uh, when an out-of-focus jeep comes towards a, 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 a muddy road, and a farmer is uh, there uh, with his uh, cattle uh, lying, uh, you know, on, on, on the ground. And uh, he comes and asks, what happened to it? He says, there is no water, uh, so I, I, I can do nothing about this situation. Now, to get a fairly strong bullock to lie down is not an easy job. So went to the veterinarian, veterinarian and then got him to come and uh, inject some <laughs> special poison, I suppose. And uh, we had to inject it to the 
good luck and then we were shooting it as the jeep came close this you got up <laughs> so what to do so then i said we have to have a stronger dose so we we were very cruel to that animal and we did that again gave it a stronger dose deepa dhanraj my assistant at that time she is also a filmmaker if you might have heard she makes documentary films and she said satyu how can you be so cruel i said look we have to get the scene you know so once sometimes we have to do such things you can't have a you know plaster of paris uh, bullock lying on the ground we can't do that i mean we could also do that you know we can make one and put it on the wood so anyway she was very upset and she walked away in the hot sun she walked away somewhere she didn't even stay when i was taking the shot so i took the shot second time and it happened the jeep came and stopped and uh, then the bullock was lying still absolutely still so so things like that you know we have to do um, in, in in films so this scene in garamava is almost very similar a personal experience of balraj sahani about his daughter and uh, the one compromise major compromise he made in his life not allowing her to marry um, a muslim so that created the entire thing and the whole thing happened like that and this um, which and then going back to other aspects of the film uh, we shot the entire film in agra first when our story was there it was not what uh, you have seen as a film the story was very different balrasani salim mirza that is was a station master in the agra fort station and uh, he used to meet a lot of his friends and uh, other members relatives and so forth migrating to pakistan every day somebody or the other migrating and he was a station master and he used to you know talk to them bid them farewell and things like that and that was the character but um, this was how we had visualized the whole film in the beginning so we went to cafe azmi uh to do the dialogue for us so when we went to him he he changed it he said this is not politically correct you know he said i said we didn't know what is politically correct or what is not correct so he made him because kafi saab had worked with the shoe factory people in kanpur and he was a labor leader and he knew how you know when he was in the union leader he knew a lot about the trade very intimate uh, experience of his so he said we change him into a factory owner in agra because agra is also a very big center for leather trade and shoe trade in fact most of uh, the bata shoes are made in agra and sold as bata you know i mean leather shoes at that time and so we shifted the whole thing we put him in to this uh, business of shoe making and um, changed the story where the rest of the characters were the same uh, other family members and so forth and uh, only the profession was changed and um, but we tried throughout to show him as normal a person like any other human being belonging to any community in this country and this was perhaps for the first time that you see a muslim represented in a film in india in that manner and that's why it is very significant 
After that, after Garam Hawa, a lot many films have come. Like Mammo, Sham Benegals, Naseem by Saeed Mirza, and many other films like this. And one Pakistani girl who made a film, um, Kamosh Pani. Uh, these are all uh, the outcome of this kind of a attitude to show the Muslim characters as normal human beings um, belonging to this, you know, mainstream of India. So this has influenced in, in many ways, uh, many, many filmmakers also. That's why it becomes a little bit significant in the annals of uh, the Indian cinema. In fact, in the hundred years of cinema, Garamava is one of the films selected um, amongst the 20 films. Uh, so, and uh, there was another very interesting thing which happened. And uh, we realized it only when we were making the film. The, there was a kind of a bias among the Hindus, they would never go into the trade of leather. There were no Hindus owning factories. There were only Muslims who owned the factories, leather factories, and, and, and the shoe trade. And there were the untouchables, the Harijans, who worked as cobblers, because there was a religious taboo against this. But when partition took place, and the Hindus who came from uh, Pakistan, they had to establish themselves somehow, somewhere, rehabilitate themselves. So they didn't care. And they took up this business, which was dying, because people were migrating from Agra and leaving their factories, you know. And so they took over the whole thing. That's how you see another character called Ajmani in the film, a Sindhi who comes from Pakistan who takes over the trade and he becomes a big uh, uh, shoe dealer, you know. So this, we had not known about this factor that how religion had played a part, you know. This came from Kafi Azmi. Uh, he, he, he developed it into this. And that was a very significant, from my point of view, that was a very significant aspect of this film. And, um, and it, it helped us a lot um, in, in showing uh, that how ultimately in your economic struggle, you don't care about religion. Religion has no place. And the same thing happens when the students gather in the tea shop. There is a Sardar, there is a Muslim, there is a Hindu, there is a Christian, maybe all types of people, all unemployed, educated, unemployed, you know. So it doesn't distinguish. The unemployment is not because of your caste or creed or, or, or your religion. It is because there are no jobs, not enough jobs for graduates. And of jobs for people who educated themselves, you know. So that, that again is an aspect which comes across in a very effective manner in the film. And ultimately, the students' position in the end for jobs, you know, changes the entire film, the, the conclusion of the film. Because in Salim is after having lost his daughter and after having lost everything, he decides to leave for Pakistan. And in the Tanga, when it comes and gets stuck in this procession, there the son wants to know whether he should join the procession or the father says, no, I won't stop you. you know. We can't live in a society secluded, he says. Join, go, and he says. And then he tells his wife also to go back to the house and gives the key to her 
and asked the Tangawala to take her back to the house. And he very listlessly walks into in the procession, you know. So, and that end on that. We end the film on that. Salim Mirza is a lost character, but he takes the right decision to stay back. You know, this is a positive aspect uh, of the whole film. We didn't want to s come to this negative conclusion that Indian Muslims should migrate to Pakistan. That was not our idea in any case. So we wanted the Muslims to stay back, and our protagonist ultimately stays back. And that is how the film ends. Yeah, some people, because I used a lot of red banners uh, in that uh, sequence, many people say, ask me, do you think communism is the only answer for all this? I said, I have not said that. But somehow revolution is always with red. So it can happen that the unemployed people might have used the red. I couldn't have used a blue flag of the Satantra party or a green flag of the Jansang. I couldn't have used it. To me, that some of that color was there, but I avoided using any of the symbols. There was no sickle and hammer symbol on the, on the, on the red cloth which we used. So this is how the whole film ends. So, because the conclusion of a film doesn't mean that's the only end. A conclusion of a film is to that extent, to the extent to which these characters are involved. It is not the ultimate end of anything that is in any film for that matter, you know. So that, that conclusion is particular to this particular sequence, particular situation, particular story that we have shown and this particular family and the protagonist of this uh, whole film. So that is more important, ultimately. And there is no doubt, if you do remember, in, there is a couplet in the end, which is, but the situation is similar, whether it is here or there. You know, it is the same thing. Whether it is in India or in Pakistan. When we say here and there, it means India or Pakistan. It is the same. The situation for them is also similar. So, um, that is the, you know, many times um, we have problems. In filmmaking, it is not so easy. We have a, a, a draconic uh, institution called the censor board. In India, after independence, every creative expression, whether it is in print media, whether it is the radio, or is the television today, it's not censored. And somehow, films are still censored. During the British period, the censor board came in because there are a lot of films were being made anti-British, anti-imperialist, and pro-Indian uh, independent movement, the freedom movement. And so they brought in this uh, censor board, and they started um, very severely uh, cutting many of the sequences from those films. And that draconian law is continuing by an independent India also. You know, many laws which are there in this country were all British laws. And still we go on continuing with that. You see, uh, this is an unfortunate part of it. Today what they have done, 
they have named this organization differently. It was first the Film Censor Board, it was. Now it is called the Certification Board. The rules are all the same. The laws applied are all the same. The prejudices are all the same. So we had this problem when we made this film. For 10 months, I didn't get a certificate to show the film in India or anywhere. The first committee which saw the film in Bombay, they said it should be banned. So I said, why? What is the reason you want to ban? It says, we don't want to open in these wounds once again, you know. So I mean, they want to do, run away from reality. You see, there are wounds. In the history of any country, there are lots of wounds. There are a lot of problems like this which come up. Then I went to a review committee of 13 people. They changed their entire opinion about the film. And they said this film can be passed. Then I knew that this whole problem would be there. So I went to Mrs. Gandhi, who was the Prime Minister at that time, and Inda Gujral was the Information Minister. I went and I showed the film even before, you know, and I showed them because I wanted to create a lobby for myself, you know. So Mrs. Gandhi saw the film on a Sunday morning at the Rashtrapati Bhavan, and she said, a film hai, and then went away. You know, and went away for lunch. And all these people went to have lunch, and Mohammad Yunus, Inda Gujral, Subhadra Joshi, there was Mrs. Gandhi, all the, all the, a few others, they all went and having lunch. But they talked about the film during lunch. Otherwise, they wouldn't have digested what they ate, I suppose. So they had to talk about it because that was something which hit them very much. And then I came to know that uh, they want to show the film to other members of parliament. So they organized the show for all the Congress members of the parliament. And the, so they all saw. Then they said, we have shown it. I think we should show it also to the opposition. <laughs> so there was another screening for the opposition. Then I said, this is becoming very dicey. So then I said, I must create another lobby, you know, a leftist lobby, you know. <laughs> so I went to the TAS news agency. They had an auditorium in, in Barakamba Road. So I have a friend of mine who acted also in this film, was working in TAS. I told him, I said, you organize a show here, and we get all the leftists to come and see, all the journalists and things. So we got them, and we showed it on another screening. So I was losing all my audience in the meantime, you know, because my Audience were a lot of people who had to be politicians, you know. <laughs> and I was losing them, but I said, anyway, we have to get the film through. So ultimately, uh, when we created, there was, uh, so then Mrs. Gandhi said, uh, don't release the film in UP. Release it somewhere else in the South, she said. I said, why? In the South, who will understand, you know, a film like this in the South? I said, I said, why not in UP? She said, no, 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 the midterm elections are coming and they think that we have sponsored the film to woo the Muslim votes. That's what they, the, how re, they reacted. So in this whole process, I, my interest to the Film Finance Corporation was increasing, you know, and uh, I was, and this whole thing which happened, my distributors, you know, left the film. They said, you, 
return our money. And so I had to do that. Ultimately, the film, with all its debts, you know, remained in the can. But by, by some fortune, I think it was, some organization in Paris, they came to know about this film. And so they invited me to bring the film and show it in Paris. And the premiere was done in Paris, you know. And the Air India gave me, I didn't have the money to go there, but the Air India gave me a free ticket to go, you know. So I went to Paris and showed the film. When the film was seen in Paris, it was immediately selected for the Cannes Festival. In the Khan Festival, for 12 long years, there was not an Indian film at all. And it was selected. And when this Khan film was, you know, was shown, and immediately the Oscar people invited the film. So like that, it became you know, something important, you know, going to Khan and going to the Oscar, being premiered in Paris. You know, all these things help. If you do it in India, it won't help. If you do it abroad, it will help. It happened, even in Patya Panchali, the same thing happened. It was shown first in Paris, then in India, you know. Things like that, this is a very strange uh, uh, phenomena. Then ultimately, I didn't know what to do. I didn't have a distributor. And suddenly, a friend of mine in Bangalore, who owned a number of theaters, he said, Satyo, I will release your film. So. We released the film in a theater called uh, Sagar on Kempegada Road and Sangeet in, in the Russell Market area. So these two theaters we booked and we showed the film. And somehow, even in Bangalore at that time, uh, we got a very good reception. And later on, no doubt, we took it to Bombay and then all over the country and then, then it became um, a, a kind of a landmark uh, film uh, in, in, in Indian cinema. So this is how the whole story is. I mean, there is a story within a story. And I would like to, if you, there is time? Another five minutes? You want to ask me something? No, 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 I was wondering, uh, I mean, how a film gets made, what things happen. Balraj Sahani, when he was, uh, we were all staying in the same hotel in uh, Sadar Bazaar in uh, uh, Agra, and uh, many days we had shot. And um, Balraj she said, where is my mother? I want to do my scenes with my mother. I said, she, she will come. So, and I actually had asked Begum Akhtar to do that role. And she had agreed to do that. Then I rang her up and she said, I'm sorry Satyu, I cannot come because my husband doesn't want me to act again. You know, she was an actress earlier. She had done films in, 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 in Bombay before, I mean, before she became a great ghazal singer. She had done some films, like Subhulakshmi. Subhulakshmi also did a um, number of films, you know. So I was in a fix. I didn't know what to do. So we were shooting in a house which belonged to one Mr. Mathur, that Haveli which is there. And we had only redecorated the whole thing to make it look more Muslim. You know, if you go to a Hindu house or a Muslim house, you see the kitchen, the vessels are all different. What Hindus use as vessels is not used by the Muslim. Muslims have their own vessels, their own metal. Aluminum is much more used with them. And, and the shapes of the uh, vessels are different. So 
So like that, we changed the whole thing and we put the chilman, that is the chick, which was there. And, uh, you know, like that, we made it, converted it, and then we, um, we wrote a Quranic saying on the, on the wall, uh, on, the, on, on top of the um, door, you know. It is called a kalma. Uh, so we put that. All these things we changed. And Mr. Mathur was always in the, after the shooting and things like that, we used to spend some time with him. And he would brag about his grandfather and um, what kind of mehfils they used to have in this house, in this angan. There are so many dancing girls and singers who would come and all that. So, so one day, I mean, because Balraji was getting upset, and so um, myself and my cameraman, uh, Irshad, we told, we asked uh, Mathur Sahib, you please take us to one of those women who used to come here, dance and sing, you know, in the night. So at 11 o'clock, <laughs> so we went into a small little lane somewhere in Kashmiri Bazaar in Agra, and knocked at a door. And a voice came from inside. Koi nahi hai, jao, kalao. No. I said, kalao. So he said, well, my mathur aya hoon, ye wo, something like that. Mere kuch dost log Bombay se aya hai, ab darwaza to kholiye. Nahi, koi ladki aya nahi hai, kalle aana hoon logon ko. It was a brothel. <laughs> And they, they thought some guests have come from Bombay, you know. So we said, they, they, then we said, Mathur Sahib, you tell her that we want to see her and not her girls. The police had raided that day her brothel and eight girls had been taken away, you know. So they said, Mujse kya kaam hai unko? Achha, then she opened with much difficulty. We got it open and then went and saw her. When we saw her, you know, we said this woman fits exactly for our role of the mother. So I said, uh, we are shooting a film in Mathur Sahib's house. Would you please accept a role to play the old mother? And she started crying. So when she started crying, I said, maybe my Urdu was wrong. I must have said something wrong. I know I was wondering why she is crying. Then she said, look, when I was 16 years old, myself and my brother, we went to Bombay and I wanted to become a film star. And we knocked at every studio and all our efforts ended up with the chowkidar of the studio at the studio gate. And very little, we got no work at all. No, no, no producer was prepared to even meet uh, uh, us, you know. And then, ultimately, in the Wadia movie tone, there was some big film going on, and there they wanted some extras, you know. So we went there and worked as extras and earned seven rupees a day, and we collected money took that money, came back. Then I became a prostitute here. And now I own this brothel. And today you have come all the way from Bombay and asking me to act in a film, which was my whole mission in my life. You know, you know it was a very touching story. So I said, I'll send you the car tomorrow morning. She said, no. No car, because the car can't come in these gullies. I know Mathu Saab's house. I will come from inside. And before we could reach, she was sitting in the angan, waiting for us next morning. And then we gave her the costumes. We had all the costumes there. I said, in any changes to be made or any alterations to be made, we'll make. but somehow it fitted her. Uh, easily and then we got the mother. So we, then we went and told Mr. Balrasani, today your mother's scenes are there. 
The story of the uh, of the mother in Pathir Panchali it is quite similar to one you narrated. It's like almost Satyajit Ray did almost the same thing. There was a woman who was, who used to be an actor and then actress. she was she was a stage actress. Yeah, and she then she was ignored and she was found in a brothel. No, it was she was a very old, famous uh, actress. Yeah, and without any job at that age. Yeah, yeah. she Pathir Panchali she. Badar Begum. Ultimately, she got two awards, one from the UP Journalists uh, Association and one from the West Bengal uh, Film Journalists Association. She was the best prize. I mean, all, and she only worked in one film. I mean, a person who wanted to become a uh, film star. You know, uh, an actress called Nini. Have you heard of Nini? Yeah, yeah. And she came from the same area in uh, Kash Kashmir Bazaar in Agra. But she was lucky she became a big star. In uh, Raj Kapoor's film, she came in Barsat. Her first film was Barsat. So things happen like this. Uh, yeah, like, well, sure. You are from Agra. Muslim population. 
and Russell market area there is a Muslim population. Like that there are blocks where Muslims live. In Malaysia are also there. Like that. But once it so happened, some news, it was a story from a Malayalam magazine, which was published in that kind of way. You know, and that upset the people so much. There was almost going to be a communal riot. You know, the Hindus were very angry and things like that. You know what the Muslims did? At one o'clock in the afternoon, the entire South Pride, that is uh, Mahatma Gandhi Road, they just came lined up silently and did the Namaz. The whole road was full. They did Namaz and dispersed. And this was the kind of answer which was given by the community. They didn't want to fight. They didn't want their riots to take place. I don't know if you people know about this. Yes. Yeah, the general of a huge congregation and very silent, absolutely silent. One of the most telling kind of uh, demonstration, you know, was there. So, I mean, this is a very nice element for a, a film. You know, you can say so much in a, in a sequence like that. Thanks. I am just asking a question. But, uh, you did a film, Garam Hava, I was that, but uh, I had a point of objection. Not objection, I can't. Uh, public, means, uh, I, my point is what? That I am telling That in the movie, that uh, I think uh, the psychology of lover, that the girl first fell in love, again she falls in love. My question is that then it might have been the period of idealistic love. That once you had a love with someone, uh, you might not tend to have love with others. But what I saw that, you know, and now, they, they, you know, the love is quite realistic. I do have a sense that it might be that you might have been trying to show that, uh, you know, to, to be in tune with the movie. The girl led to have death. She fell in love and uh, uh, she got a, uh, you know, physical, uh, yeah. sexual relations, she died. And at the end of the movie, when they go, they do not go back to Pakistan, they remain in India. So here you are making idealism winning, getting on. Making idealism winning in the sense that uh, the film must have been more realistic if they had gone to Pakistan because in case of love affection, you showed that this was the reality. You did not lead the love to uh, reach to the idealism. If the girl had not fallen again, she would have died waiting for the, uh, the first lover. So it's the kind of contradiction which I am now seeing. In the Could you explain? I don't know the circumstances under which um, she faces the first person who makes a genuine effort to come back and get married to her. But unfortunately, uh, there are many restrictions uh, by the government uh, regarding you have to report to the police the moment you come there. Then you have to have a passport, you have to have a visa. And things like that, which he doesn't have. No legal documents he has. He has only his love for this woman, this girl, and then he wants to marry. And that is just an emotional aspect of it. And no uh, law cares for your emotions that way. You know. so it's a very personal thing. So she, so she loses him. She got, gets jilted by this whole thing. This is beyond her, beyond the entire family. You know, and ultimately the second person who is done has been wooing this girl whom she doesn't like as such. Basically, she doesn't like him so much. But ultimately, she sort of concedes that sequence in Fatehpur Sikri uh, shows that, uh, which I've shot uh, um, there when they go. Uh, to Salim Chisti's uh, Darga uh, to pray and then talk about Sikandar's uh, exams and things like that. I mean, get a, get a boon from the, the great Chisti. 
But um, at that time she somehow feels that it is not the ultimate. Okay, one failure is there. The second attempt can be made. And so she agrees to this boy. But then he also gives So this kind of a tragedy which occurs twice leads her to, um, but she did make an effort the second time, you know, to restart her life with another person. I mean, this is a positive aspect as far as the girl is concerned. But unfortunately, both the cousins let her down. So it is how I have seen it only like that. Ideas about you know how to 
look at the problem and how to work. Did you face any problem in your making with this Bharat Sahani app as per every army script or did you have to see idea? in if you have noticed the film almost all the actors they belong to one particular ideology. They all came from the Indian people's radio movement. Whether it is in Agra, Delhi, or Bombay, they all belong to that group. Only Jalalaga was not a theater person. Even Farooq Sheikh was a Iqtam member. You know. And by the way, no doubt she was not. So that ideological kind of uh, situation which was there and everyone understood one another you know and what we were trying to say they were in line with that and that's why it helped me making the film in this manner if, uh, if ideologically they will have different types of people it's very difficult to coordinate them it's very very difficult so I was fortunate Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, this thing happened uh, earlier uh, in the Indian cinema in a film called Nichanagar, produced by and directed by Chetan Anand, which is one of the very first film to get a Khan Award in India. And so that film also had similar type of people working in it. They are all from theatre. And left his theatre. And then Abbas Saab made a, a film, Dharti Ke Lal, and that was also had the same kind of film. Then Biman Roy made Do Bhiga Zameen, which again had a similar kind of situation. So, you know, this always helps because the ideological uniformity is necessary when you are making or in theatre also. So, I mean, I, I basically belong to a um, particular, I mean, I belong to the ICTA. I still am a member of the ICTA in Bombay, and my plays are running there. Three of my plays are on uh, in Bombay regularly, although I am living in Bangalore. But I go direct the plays and then they carry on. So, but the group uh, which is there, they, to a great extent, ideologically uh, coherent. You know, they will belong to one idol. But we have some newcomers who, I mean, who are not dealt very much with the politics of the group and the And then we slowly convert them. <laughs> Slowly, I said, we have to do that. I mean, all, this is all planned, you know. We don't say no to anybody, we ask them to come work. And then, if a person comes to work as an actor, we don't, he doesn't get a chance to work as an actor the moment he comes. Two to three years it takes in Ikta to get a chance to go on stage. At the time, you will be sweeping the floor, you will be doing other jobs, you know, giving chai to everyone. Uh, and that kind of work you will do. But he has to be sincere. Two, three years, if he does that, then he will be upgraded. And he will be given a small role to test, you know. So there are a lot of people who come to it like that. We have a hundred members at the moment, uh, active members. And there are a lot of other groups in the whole country. We have uh, groups in Alabama, we have Raipur, we have um, um, Agra, Delhi, and uh, in Kerala we have one group which is you now almost. Um, I mean, they do a few plays in, in Calcutta. There was a group which split, and the Communist Party in India split, they also split. So some became Marxist and some became CPI. So it's like that. And this thing goes on. And these are all part of the game.
and Balraj Sahani, like you said, Miss Wesley, Wow. So as Farooq Sheikh is very that because this the movie ends with this line, it seems to indicate that he's been resigning himself to everything until then. And we need this. So that was a little disconcerting for me. But I, I noticed this earlier when I watched the movie the second time, a few months back. And so I just wanted to know where the entire voice came from. It's in Tati Azmi's voice. So. Yeah, now, now I have to tell you the truth. <laughs> <laughs> I think I know the truth. <laughs> you know? <laughs> it has no, 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 it so happened because of the censorship problem. Okay. So we had to introduce that couplet. And then, then say that the situation is the same whether it is here or there. This was a compromise which we did. We didn't have it in the original script, but we got this written later on after all these objections. And in the Gujral said, you do something like this. And then. Okay. Uh, I also interpreted Yahabi and Wahabi as big Muslims also and Hindus also. Right? Yeah. Uh, that's why it seemed, did not quite fit with how the movie was narrated as well. So. No, you just tried to justify it in a way, but uh, there was no need for it, I could say. Without that couplet also, it could have been. A silent march. There was no need. The, the government, you know, is. So we are very anxious at the time to see that the film gets released much more than anything else. Uh, I just wonder, uh, were there any influences uh, while you were making the film? Yeah, films. What, what did, did you have any influences of any other filmmakers or any other film when you made this film? To me, I was greatly impressed by the um, neo-realistic films of uh, uh, Italy, mm. like the films made by Desi Khan and Ezra. I had seen 1950, I saw in Madras, I saw um, um, bicycle Thief. Oh. Um, that was the very first international film festival in India. First it was shown in Bombay and then it was brought to Madras. In Madras they showed it. And I went to Madras. I was a student in Central College at the time. So I went to Madras and uh, I saw and I was greatly impressed by it. And later on almost many of these films had been filmed. I mean, this neorealistic school is, um, has influenced me much more than the new way of France, yeah. you know. I mean, if you talk of Godard and, and uh, Bunuel and others, you know. Bunuel also is a very good filmmaker. Um, I mean, there are lots of people like Frankenheimer, for example, or Alfred Hitchcock, you know, these are, or um, Elia Kazan, you know, uh, who have an uh, influence uh, somewhere or the other, inspired me. Okay. Up to the introduction, I have said that you have seen two films on the other side of the film. Yes. 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 And Chandan about my new projects which are going to be there. In fact, I was supposed to meet my producers from Delhi today, um, um, but they didn't come. Uh, they are coming next week to meet me. Uh, I mean, I'm basically a very um, politically minded person, and uh, I have my, all my theater is political. And all my films are also political, except the last film which I made for Reliance Big Pictures called Ijur. Ijur means in incompatible. So it was on the Devdasi system, uh, in a way. It's about a Devdasi. So that uh, now I'm planning to make one film which is about the prejudice that we have. Um, about uh, social 
structure, social caste, and you know, and uh, class differences. So in, in an organization like ISRO, um, there was a case where a very highly qualified uh, person who did the PhD in aerodynamics and uh, she got a job there, but then circumstances had forced her in a way uh, to marry an illiterate person who was an auto driver. And she herself came from a very uh, high Brahmin family. And it's a real incident, I'm not putting it up. It's a real thing which happened in this room. And then they, but the scientists, the administrators and other colleagues in the uh, ISRO didn't like this whole, uh, you know, relationship between her and, and the auto driver. They resented. You know, because of a lot of prejudices which they have. You might be a scientist, you might be thinking of a person to send, send him to the moon and things like that today. We are capable of doing that. <coughs> As a country, we are prepared for that. But many things are stuck in us. You know, and we go by these kind of rituals in our lives. And in the whole process, this girl was suspended from this row. They, you know, it's a false thing that by marrying you can't change your community. The Indian law is such a constitution. Suppose you are a Brahmin and you marry a Dalit, you don't become a Dalit. Or a Dalit doesn't become a Brahmin. Shuddhi is not possible at all in Indian, Indian society. So, no matter how educated, how well versed, even how well versed in the Vedas, and but if you are not born in the community of a Brahmin, you cannot become a Brahmin. You can't become equal to a Brahmin. You remain a Dalit or whatever you are. The origin of your birth is the only thing which is taken into consideration. But people are under the wrong impression to get a job, they thought, by marrying a Dalit, you become a Dalit, and so you get uh, some reserved seat in it. Which is wrong, it doesn't happen. So, this kind of thing is there. The Indian Constitution, constitution doesn't allow. In fact, you know, Ambedkar wrote this. Right from the days of the Mahabharata and Dronacharya, who was not give, ready to give uh, the, the education in archery to Ekalavya, but Ekalavya on his own merit, he learns. And what does he say? I kept you as my guru in front of me. I made a model of you and kept you as a guru and I practiced. And he says, and then Arjuna says he's better than me. But then Dronachar asked for the thumb, the right thumb, as Guru Dakshana. And Ekalavya agrees to it, but cuts his thumb and brings it, you know, and gives it to Dronachar. And that kind of cruelty was there. And Arjuna asked, why are you doing this? He said, you don't understand. If these people are given a chance, all of us will be nowhere. They will rise in the society. So this, this has been there, this depravation has been there in this country. And what Ambedkar wrote ultimately was also this, where he disagreed with the Atma Gandhi. And then he himself became a Buddhist. The neo Buddhist society in India is not because of that. So, 